Amen. Thank you, James, for playing for us. Thank you, Wanda, for playing the organ. Oh, what a wonderful gift it is that uh, we have music. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter number 3, if you have them close at hand. Acts chapter number 3. We're in the process of going through the book of Acts, and so we've been learning a lot. And uh, we're going through Acts chapter 3. We'll be starting at verse number 12, all the way through chapter 4, verse and number 4. You might think from just the announcement from this morning about Jeremiah is now Acts. I don't like uh, chapter <laughs> uh, differentials, you know, I guess, uh, difference of uh, point of chapters, but we'll go through it, and uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verse number 12, all the way through chapter 4, verse number 4. All right, uh, let's go ahead, verse number 12, and you follow along as I read out loud. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham of, and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and de denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I, I want or know that through, your, through ignorance ye did, did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before hath showed by the mouth of all of his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, and your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever ye shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, ha having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hold hands on of them and put them in and hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the time we have together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Father, we ask you to move among us. We ask you to help us to have our eyes opened to see the spiritual realities that we see in Scripture. Father, we ask you to mend our hearts, help those who have needs, may they be met. May you help us to look forward to the second coming of Christ by how we live and how we serve you. And Father, we ask you now to help each one of us to look to you as the author and the finisher of our faith. Look to you 
who is the satisfaction of our souls. Look to you who are who is our great, exceeding great reward. Father, we ask you to bless this time together. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start off today with asking a rhetorical question, or rather a question for you just to think about. Somebody got on me saying, a rhetorical question is not something that you don't think about, but rather something that doesn't need to be answered. Okay, I understand that. And actually, it, I looked it up, and the definition is not quite that, uh, that clear. But So just to think about this question, all right? Are you ready? Do you believe in miracles? Now, don't answer. Don't answer. Do you believe in miracles? The question is a very interesting one because, well, what's your definition of miracles? Well, there are three different definitions of miracles, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, both and all three of them will come in handy. Okay, so I'm going to give you three examples of the possibility of miracles. So just think to yourself, which one is a miracle if not all three? Okay, so it could be multiple choice here. So the first one is specifically, a baby is born in the hospital. Don't answer. Is it a miracle? The second one, Jesus turns water into wine. Is it a miracle? Don't answer. Just think about it. The next one, it's a little more of a joke. 1980 U.S. hockey team winning against the Soviet Union and the announcer said, do you believe in miracles? That's the third one. And so the question is, do, what is consisting of a miracle? What is the definition of a miracle? Which one of these three is a miracle? Well, the first de definition of a miracle that I was given is specifically an event that is unusual or unexpected. Now, true enough, with that just being the lone definition, I would say, well, that 1980 hockey team winning against the Soviet Union, that was unusual or un unexpected. Not many people would say, well, the hockey team will actually win against the Soviet Union. Um, but yet, they did. And so, would you consider that a miracle? Do you believe in miracles? So, something that is unexpected or uh, unusual. The second definition, specifically, is a, anything that goes against any scientific uh, nature, something that is out of the ordinary scientifically. Like, for instance, Jesus turning water literally into wine. Now, when I was in high school, I unfortunately took chemistry. Everything I remember from chemistry is summed up in this. I don't know. Uh, so I didn't really remember much. I didn't really learn much. But the first day, my science teacher came up, and she had all these different uh, uh, glasses right in front of her. And I still remember this to this day. She's like, okay, for in this class, you're going to learn how water, she picks up a glass of water, turns into wine. And then right off the bat, she, she pours it into the other, other glass, and whoop, there it is. It looks like wine. And then she went from wine to orange juice, orange juice from, to like some other thing, and then all the way down. Now, the question is, how did she do that? Well, uh, see, I never really figured that one out. What my thought was, that that glass is not empty. There's something in it that turned it into what looks like wine. Jesus, on the other hand, said, fill up those, uh, those pitchers, and they filled up the pitchers. There's nothing in them but the pitcher and that of water. And he said, okay, take some to the host of the feast. They once again, they took the water out, and they came, gave it to the host of the feast. Now, I don't know exactly when it turned into wine. Did it turn into wine when they finished obeying Christ, and they took some out? Did it become wine when they took it out and then brought it to the host? While they were going, it turned into wine. Or was it right when he was given the wine, did it turn into wine? It doesn't really matter, but it's the reality of water turned into the best grape juice, the best wine that you, the host has yet to taste. Wow, whatever, wherever you got this, this is the best. You, say, you have served the best last. So we see that as a scientific impossibility for water to turn into wine or grape juice. Uh, so yeah, in that definition, that would be a miracle.
But then the third definition that I really, really enjoyed is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. What it said about miracles, that specifically, the event is not the purpose. I thought, oh, that's interesting. The event is not the purpose of a miracle. The purpose of a miracle, the actual reality of a miracle, is that it's a sign pointing to someone or something else. So what it is, is an event in life that you can say is a miracle when you can take that point and go back to God and say, God did this, God did that. Now we'll go back to that example of a baby being born. Now, if you take the second definition of miracle, is that a miracle? By the second definition, you would have to say no. But the third definition, yes, because God made that baby. God knit that baby in the womb. God is the author of life. God is the one that caused that baby to be born and born healthy. And so, yes, we can always point to God. So each one of those three are examples of different definitions of what a miracle is. Now the question is, not do you believe in miracles, but rather, are you a miracle? Are you a miracle? So we're going to go through the text today, and we're going to see three specific miracles that has something to do with us on a daily basis. Notice with me in Acts chapter number 3, and we first understand that this is in the context of a miracle. We understand that. In the very first part of chapter 3, we have that of the healing of the, the beggar man. He was there at the temple, uh, at the, the gate, beautiful. And then Peter goes over to him and he says, uh, look at me. He's asking for money. Look at me. What I give you is not silver and gold, but what I give you, what I have is what I'll give you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. And then he helped him up. His ankles were restored to health. He has never walked a day in his life. He is at least 40 years old, never walked a day. And now he is leaping and he's jumping and he's praising God with what God has done for him. Now that we could say, definitely a miracle, a, a second definition miracle. But think about this with me. What we have in the Peter's sermon are three specific miracles. Notice with me what it says here. The first miracle that we're going to see is, well, it reminds us of last week, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Notice with me in verse number 12, it says, And when Peter saw it, saw that everybody's saying how wonderful and everything is, is great because that man was healed, he saw it and he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? It is impossible for me to go in and of myself to make somebody that is unable to walk able to walk. I have no power in and of myself to do that. Now, when we pray and somebody gets healed, that's an entirely different thing. Who is really doing it? Well, it's God doing it by using the prayers that we offer be for other people. So here he says, no, no, don't look at me. Don't look at John. We're not the, the, the source of this power. We, we and of ourselves, we cannot make this man walk, but he is walking. Here's, I'm going to tell you why. In verse number 13, that God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. It's good to be reminded about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even the week after Easter. You know, we praise the Lord for Easter, and it was a wonderful day. Um, and but yet we still can remind ourselves about the resurrection because it doesn't stop in one day. We should not forget, okay, he is still alive. Jesus Christ raised from the dead on the third day, defeating hell, defeating death, and has given us 
everything that we ever need in everlasting life, forgiveness of sins. He has defeated everybody that is against us, and he has given us life and life to its fullest. If we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, then we are in his likeness going to be one day raised again from the dead. For those of us that are, we make it to the rapture of the church, which who knows? It might be tomorrow. It might be today. It might be a thousand years from now. I'm not sure, but God knows. God knows. But if we make it and we are alive and remain, we are going to be brought up together with Christ, given a new created body, perfect in every way. I'm looking forward to that. No more glasses. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, we have so much to look forward to. Jesus Christ was ro ri risen from the dead. But how does that help us at all? How does that help us? Turn with me now to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6 is a wonderful chapter talking about Jesus being ro raised from the dead. Notice with me in chapter 6 what it says here. And this is talking about baptism, specifically in verses uh, 3 through 5. Now, specifically, is it talking about spiritual baptism or water baptism? I believe it's spiritual baptism that's emphasizing here. It could be water. I, I, I'll say, well, just study it out and, and come back to me if what you think. Uh, verse number 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The reality of the resurrection shows us that we have the ability through Christ to walk in newness of life, not in the oldness of the letter of the law. Before you got saved, you were one way. But now that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, you should be walking a different way. You should be more and more conformed into the image of Christ. Like the things that we say should be exactly what Christ would say. The thoughts that we think should be the thoughts that he thunk. Uh, we have before us all the different possibilities of what we could do with our hands with the different opportunities that god has given us may they all be to glorify god through christ may they be exactly what christ would do he has given us that ability through the resurrection of the dead we were dead in christ and then we being put into christ now we are made alive from the dead Notice what also it says in verse number 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him and that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Realized of who we are in Christ. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ to be the Savior of your own self, to be your, the everlasting life that you will be given, you put your faith in Christ and what he did on the cross, he gives you life eternal, but now it's the possibility for us to be more and more like Christ if we say no to the things of the flesh. Say no to the sins which so easily beset us. Say no to our old sinful nature. Say no to what the world around us is saying for us to do. I don't know if you all have been noticing uh, in the news, this world is not getting very much better. <laughs> uh, I, some, you know, some people have this idea that eventually the church will usher in the millennial kingdom. Uh, I don't see that anywhere uh, in Scripture nor anywhere in the world. Man is just getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and we're just getting so confused in the process. 
I don't think any one of us, thinking back when we were younger, would say, oh, yeah, one day this is going to happen to America. Oh, yeah, one day we'll, we'll be so confused about uh, gender identities that, that, uh, that people are going to say that they're male when they're actually female and female when they're actually male, and that's okay. Well, no, God made you one way. God made you male or God made you female. That's what the Bible says. And to say, I'm going to be anything else but what God has made me is kind of putting a finger in God's eye. It's like, I know better than you. No, no, God knows more. God knows exceedingly, abundantly, above all. He knows everything about you and made you the way that he did. He put you in the place where you were born. He put you with the parents that you were born to. He put you in the specific situations in order for you to be you. It's an amazing thing to think about. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead gives us the ability to become more and more like Christ, less like the world. More and more like Christ, less like the devil. It's an amazing thing when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says that ye are of your father, the devil. That's pretty strong language, I want to say. Uh, <laughs> I might uh, say it in that way. I'm like, well, that's, that's really coming out there and just say what you think. Uh, but yeah, he's the perfect son of God and he did it right. Uh, you are of your father, the devil. Ooh, what a condemnation against a group of people that thought they were self-righteous, that thought they were righteous before God. No, you're of your father, the devil. Whoa, amazing. For us to be more and more like Christ, for us to be like Christ in every which way, we need to submit to him daily. We need to go to his word and to understand it more and more. And so we ought to walk in newness of life because we're in Christ. You know, when we go to heaven, it's not going to be all the different things about this world that uh, will make a difference for all eternity. It's not the TV shows that we watch. It's not the movies that we'll see. It's not the <laughs> entertainment, the events of sports that we'll ever view that will make any difference for all eternity. It doesn't matter what book you read, unless it is for growing in Christ. Just thinking about that, when we see our Savior, it's not going to be the things that of this world that will be holding dear, but rather the things that we do for Christ. And the more and more we do for Him, the more and more we're not going to be ashamed before His, his throne. He could say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Boy, that's a marvelous thing to have as the thing that he says for each and every one of us. May we strive to be more and more like Christ. That's the first miracle, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Turn back with me to Acts chapter number 3. The second miracle that Peter talks about, and it really uh, stirred me when I was reading through this passage over and over again is number two, not just the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but also, number two, the inspiration of Scripture. The inspiration of Scripture. Notice with me what he says. Notice with me, verse number, let's start in verse number 17. And now, brethren, I want or know that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before have showed by the mouth of all his prophets... That Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was, be, was before was preached, unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began." Over and over again, he talks about the prophets, that Jesus Christ came, and everything that he did was according to what the prophets had already foretold. You know, that's an amazing thing. If you think about all the prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled in his lifetime, it is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, one mathematician actually figured it out. If you take seven of the Old Testament prophecies, the possibility of them being fulfilled by one person in one point in time in one place 
it is as if you go to the state of Texas. Now, Texas is a huge state, I want to say. I've never been there, but looking at the map, I think, wow, that is a big state. You take Texas, and then you take uh, was a silver dollar bills, or silver dollar coins, and you put them, I think it was like four feet high. This is not four feet, this is four feet. Uh, four feet high, deep, and then you take somebody throughout Texas, just drop him anywhere, and he's blindfolded. He goes around Texas, and the possibility of somebody fulfilling seven of those prophecies about Jesus is the same possibility for this guy to just walk, 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 then all of a sudden he stops, gets down, and finds a red coin that was shuffled in randomly. Texas is a big state, I'll tell you that. And four, four feet deep, that is quite a significant event. Jesus not only fulfilled seven, he fulfilled majority of the prophecies given to him. You say majority? Yeah, he hasn't come back yet. Second coming, still there. Uh, there's a lot about the second coming of Christ, but a lot about his first. So his first, he has fulfilled ultimately. He has filled utterly and so all the prophets are fulfilled in who Jesus Christ was supposed to be. He was born of a virgin, specifically Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. He was born specifically in Bethlehem, Micah chapter number 5, I want to say, uh, verse number 2, if I remember correctly. We see him work miracles, the book of Isaiah. We see him do all these different things. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, uh, Jeremiah, as well as Zechariah says about that. He came on to a cult uh, into Jerusalem, Zechariah chapter number 11, I want to say. You could spot check that. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's in Zechariah. I know that much. Uh, chapter 11, I believe. But then you, you get to the, pr the crucifixion of Jesus. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I see my bones and they stare at me. I, my hands and my feet are pierced. Water and blood flow out. Psalm 22. Then you go to Isaiah chapter 53 and you find out why he, w he died. Taking the sins of all humanity upon himself. And then we see the gloriousness of his resurrection at the end of chapter 53. Amazing. Everything that has done, as well as he was uh, buried in a rich man's tomb, specifically. He could not have controlled any bit of these things. He could not control where he was born. He could not control when he was born. He could not control who to whom he was born. But yet, every single Thing about the prophecy of Jesus came true literally in his lifetime. He is the Messiah, no matter what anybody has to say. In fact, the specific time frame as to when he was supposed to come to Jerusalem, Daniel chapter 9, end of that chapter, talks specifically as to the year by which he was supposed to come. And exactly that year he came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. Everybody shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna the highest. Blessed be the, the, the person that comes in the name of the Lord. All of this happens with Jesus. Amazing the how accurate Scripture is. It's an amazing thing that we have the inspired word of God for our all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Stop right there. It's profitable. How profitable? Well, it can make a dead man alive. It can man make a lost person found. It can make a person that has enmity towards God a friend of God. It, can ha it has the power to give you salvation First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. It is the most amazing literature in all history of human writing. It is the only which book by which we can get saved. It is the only one with the words of life. It is the only thing that can help us in times of trouble. Now, you can get all the self-help books you want, but this is the best because it's God's only book that he wrote. Just an amazing thing. Scriptures. The question is for us. 
if this is a miracle in and of itself, and we haven't even talked about the preservation of the scriptures itself. Another story. Man, it's an amazing story about what God has done with his word. The question is, are we using it, are we reading it each and every day so that we become like Christ? Are we in it every day and letting the word of God speak to us in a, in a new way to help us in the way we ought to go? Are we using it as the only words by which we can live by? That question, I hope you can answer yes. That each and every day we get into the word. He says in Joshua chapter number one that if you study my law, if you meditate there in day and night, your way shall be prosperous and you'll have great success. In Psalm, Psalm 1, we see that he that meditates on the word of God day and night, he is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that his fruit will come in its season, and the leaf will never wither, never grow other than green. And whatsoever he doeth pro shall prosper. It's all about the word of God. A miracle in your hands. A miracle that can be in your mind and in your heart if you do as it says to do. So we see, first of all, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the first miracle. Second miracle that we see is the inspiration of Scripture itself. And the third miracle, specifically, is one of the most important, that of salvation for the individual. Notice with me what he says, verse number uh, 19 in Acts chapter 3. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Here he says, repent. We talked about repentance uh, a little while ago. So what it is, is to change your mind about something from one degree to another. For instance, these people did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. These people were the people that actually said, crucify him, crucify him. These are the same exact people that wanted him dead. And now they're going to go from thinking one way about Jesus, then turning about face, doing 180, to the other saying he is Messiah, he is God in the flesh, he is the one that was supposed to come, he is Christ. What a difference in mindset that will be when they said crucify him to he is my Lord and he's my God. What a difference that is. And so many people today have a different rendering of who Jesus is. Some say that he's a hippie that only wants to talk about love, love and peace. Well, he, he is love. God is love. But yet, he has come so that man ha can have life. But yet, he's coming back the second time, not as the Lamb of God, but rather as the righteous judge. They, they miss that part about, about poor hippie G Jesus. Or they talk about Jesus and they talk, he's a good moral philosopher. No, the things that he said, he's either a lunatic or he's a liar or he's Lord. There's no way around it. He says, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that uh, comes to me will never die. Only a lunatic would ever say that if he did not mean it. He is Lord. Because he can do everything that he has said he can do. And so for us today, notice with me what happens here after it's all said and done. Uh, verse number, uh, chapter 4 now, notice with me what happened. And as they spake unto people, unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Next week, we'll talk about why that's important with these individuals. Notice with me what it says, verse 3. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now even time. Notice this. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. That is an amazing amount. The first time that... Peter preached in chapter 2, we're looking at 3,000. Now he preaches the second time, it's 
5,000. Boy, he's getting better. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of one of those things. He's getting better at preaching, I guess. Uh, no, it's all about God and, and working in the people and, and through the people to convict them of their sin and then turning from what they used to believe about Christ to accepting Christ as their own personal Savior. Salvation is what matters. You know, it's an amazing thing. Jesus Christ died a sinful, painful death uh, for each and every one of us. He became sin for us. God's wrath was kindled, was poured out upon him by which we can be saved. But yet, God does not force you into that relationship. It is your choice. God has done everything for each and every one of us to get saved. The answer, the question for each and every one of us, have we been saved by the blood of Christ? Are we in Christ? Have we ever accepted Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior? Now, if you say, oh, I've been to church all my life, doesn't matter. Oh, I, I pray a lot. Well, that doesn't matter if you're not in Christ. Well, I read through the Bible once every year. Great. But are you in Christ? Well, I've been baptized. Great. You got wet. Are you in Christ? <laughs> One person actually uh, was uh, debating with me a little bit about uh, a few weeks back when I talked about uh, that baptism is not a need for salvation itself. And so what I have to say to that is, well, what does the majority of the Bible say? Be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Call upon whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That doesn't talk about baptism in those places. I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except there be baptized. No, it doesn't say that, except through me. Now, baptism is a part about sanctification. We could talk about that. But when you're being justified before God's eyes, God looks at you. He sees Jesus. Because we receive Jesus as our own personal Savior. That is the needful thing for us to do. If you have never done that today, or you have not done this before now, do it today. You never know what's going to happen today. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. For those who are in Christ, how much of the word are we getting in our lives? If we are in Christ, how much of the resurrection are we actually showing the people around us? How much of Christ are we showing the people that we know, that we see at the store, that we know at our clubs? How much of Christ are we showing those people. I'll ask uh, Wanda to come to the organ. We're going to have a time where we can get alone before, between us and God. And whatever it is the Lord has shown you, whatever uh, conviction that he is convicting you about, may we get alone with him and, and talk with him about that. If you have never received Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, then I recommend that you pray and receive him today. It's not hard. Something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Christ died for me. I know that by putting my faith in Jesus Christ, you'll give me the gift of eternal life. You'll forgive me of my sins. I do that right now as we pray. So let's go ahead and pray together. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for this day you have given us. We ask you today, may we do business with you. May you cause our hearts and our minds to agree with you, to submit to your will, to submit to your word. Father, may you work amongst us even right now. I do pray, in Jesus' name.